Hey guys, Dr. O again. Cell structure and function. So before we jump into the review, I just want to talk about like cells. I'm just so fascinated by cells. The number of cells that it takes, you know, to make up a human, you know, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 37 trillion cells now. They're, they're, these numbers are constantly changing, but our best guesses put us in that ballpark for most people. Of course, in my microbiology classes, I talk about how you have just about as many microbial cells. But um, what I really wanted to just pause for a moment and talk about the fact that cells, you take non-living building part part but blocks and you put them together and you now have life like we can talk about you know all different things about existence and where the universe come from or chicken or egg debates and all this kind of stuff but just think about that think about how these non-living structures these non-living building blocks these non-living organelles they're the focus of this chapter or at least the beginning of it when you put them together out spews life you know what makes me different than this table and this computer is that i'm alive and um, that leap that leap from non-living building blocks to living cells is the most fascinating thing in the universe to me. So I just wanted to frame uh, how I feel about cells anyways. Okay, let's jump right in. What is the difference between a somatic cell and a sex cell? So somatic makes, I think, body and sex. So, so a somatic cell is going to be your body cells, and sex cells will be your sex cells, your, your gametes. So every cell in my body is a somatic cell except for male sex cells, the, gam the male gametes, the sperm. Every sex cell in a, or every cell in a woman's body is going to be a somatic cell except for the female gametes, the, um, um, the egg. So, um, so the difference is somatic cells are diploid or diploid, meaning they have two sets of chromosomes. So my, my body cells have 23 sets or 23 pairs of chromosomes. A sex cell is going to be haploid. It's only going to have one set of chromosomes. So a sperm and an egg each have 23 chromosomes. Um, a somatic cell, a body cell, or even a fertilized egg, that zygote, will have two, two sets of 23 now or 46 chromosomes. So it's semantics, but I generally do say two sets of chromosomes. Some people say two pairs. Only reason I do is because men are XY, so we don't have a pair of X chromosomes, and we do have a pair of sex chromosomes, I guess, and females or XX, but no big deal. So you would say somatic cells are 2N and sex cells are N or 1N, diploid versus haploid. All right, um, define cytology. So ology is the study of, cytology is the study of cells. So everything we're going to learn about in this chapter is, is really cytology. Nothing else, nothing sexy to say about that. All right, define the fluid mosaic model of the phospholipid bilayer of the cell slash plasma membrane. That's a mouthful. So your cell membrane and your plasma membrane are the same thing. So we'll, let's just call it a cell membrane for now, but uh, it is the same thing. So there are the, the ways that we describe this this cell membrane is as a fluid mosaic model and a phospholipid bilayer. So I'll, I'll define all those terms separately. So, but before I do that, when I think of the, the function of it, I like to, you know, when, when people say, what's the brain of the cell, the control center, people always say the nucleus and that's okay. But I think of the nucleus more like a vault because its job is to protect, house and protect DNA. And of course other things happen inside. But when I think of the brain of a cell, I think of the cell membrane. What senses the world around it? processes that information and, and responds to it. The cell membrane does. So I actually consider the cell membrane or plasma membrane to be the brain of the cell. But that's like kind of, it's tricky. I'm not going to ask you a question about that. Okay, but first, phospholipid bilayer. So your plasma membrane, your cell membrane, is two layers of phospholipids. So, and the, re and the reason they set up, these membranes would form on their own if you poured these phospholipids into a glass of water because um, the, the phosphate heads are hydrophilic. They love water. The fatty acid tails, the, the, the two tails, the, the bi, the, because phospholipids don't have, are not a triglyceride, they only have two tails. Those tails hate water. They're hydrophobic. So they get they set up in a bilayer where the tails can all avoid water and the heads get to be exposed to the water on the inside and outside the cell. So that's why it's called the phospholipid bilayer. The reason you call it a fluid mosaic is twofold. It's a mosaic. Like when I think of a mosaic, I think of like pictures made of pictures, you know, like I remember seeing one, a picture of Obama made of a thousand pictures of Obama or something. Or think, you know, when you put a bunch of things together, it's a mosaic. So it's not just this phospholipid bilayer. There's also cholesterol and there's all sorts of different proteins and there's carbohydrates and antigens and all these things. So that's why it's called the mosaic. The reason it's called a fluid mosaic is because it's not rigid. 
You look in a textbook and you see a cell membrane, it looks rigid, right? But the consistency of the cell membrane is about the same as olive oil. So your cell membranes can tear pretty easily and cholesterol keeps that from happening to, to some extent. But you're, they're fluid. So that's why it's good to watch animations of this because a protein that's embedded in this phospholipid bilayer is floating around and can actually move and change shape in the membrane. It's not stuck anywhere. It's not anchored. It's something floating on a pool of water, not anchored to that water. So that's what fluid, meaning not rigid, fluid mosaic model means, and that's why you call it a phospholipid bilayer. All right, these are not all the organelles. You know, make sure you go, you know, you go through all the organelles, but these are the key ones to me. So, um, I mean, I personally, I really like the peroxisome, even though I didn't put it on this list, but be able to define the function of the following organelles. So the plasma membrane, I already said it's called the gatekeeper because um, it is a semi-permeable membrane. So membranes can be freely permeable, which allows everything in and out. That doesn't work well with living cells because we couldn't store, we couldn't keep things where we need them. Um, membranes can be impermeable, meaning nothing gets in and out. That wouldn't work in living cells because couldn't get nutrients in and waste products out. So our cells have to be semi-permeable. You may also hear them called selectively permeable. So um, that's what they are. So the function of the plasma membrane is to be a gatekeeper, to be a bouncer. You can come in, you can't come in. You need to stay in, you can go out. These kind of things, so that's why we call it a gatekeeper. But I do like to call it the brain of the cell too because it does have to respond to the world around it in a way that you know our nervous system and brain would. So that's the function of the plasma membrane. The centrioles, so centrioles are only needed, they're needed for mitosis, for cell division. So centrioles that are going to, they're gonna play a big role in grabbing DNA and lining it up and pulling it into two piles during the cell cycle. So uh, that, that's what they're for. Centrioles are needed for cell division. Uh, microvilli. So you see on the surface of a cell, uh, the two main things you would see would be a microvilli or cilia. So microvilli are going to be shorter. They, they, what their job is to increase surface area. So if you see a cell with microvilli on its surface, like in your small intestine, for example, it means it needs a massive surface area for moving things, either absorbing or secreting things. So microvilli think surface area. Cilia, uh, with human cells, because most of our cells are actually attached to other cells and don't move, cilia move material over our cell surfaces. If I was a single-celled eukaryote, um, I would use cilia like ores, and I would actually move with them, but, but cilia in human cells move material instead. So we'll talk about ciliated cells in, in the histology chapter. All right, so that's microvilli, just think increased surface area. Ribosomes, they're the site of translation or the site of protein synthesis. So ribosomes are the location where RNA becomes uh, chains of amino acids, becomes proteins. So that's what ribosomes are. You'll see in a moment there are different types of ribosomes. The lysosome, I, I consider this the digestive system of the cell. It's a bag of acid and enzymes that can break down, uh, it can break down damaged organelles, it can break down proteins that need, need to be recycled, it can break down food stuff and, and kill bacteria, etc. So think of it as the digestive system of the cell. The mitochondria is called the powerhouse of the cell. This is where 95% of ATP production comes from. This is where uh, intermediate step, the Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain system, electron transport chain occur uh, in your cellular respiration. All right, uh, now the my, I mean, very significant, I mean clinically significant because um, energy production is a, is a very important part of being alive. You have to constantly be churning out energy. There are theories of aging that basically say we, our mitochondria start to age, which causes all other aging. So I think, I think that aging is multifactorial, much more complex than that, but mitochondria are very important. You're seeing, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty firm believer in the metabolic theories of cancer that actually say that malfunctioning mitochondria play a much larger role in cancer than we give them credit for. Most people think that cancer is just, uh, you know, genetic mutation, just DNA mutation stuff. But I think faulty energy metabolism is a major player in cancer as well. All right, um, the nucleus. So the nucleus, uh, you know, it's called the control center, but, but primarily it houses and protects your DNA. So I think of it more like a vault. Uh, inside the nucleus, you'd have the nucleolus. nucleolus. It's going to synthesize the, you know, the proteins needed to make your ribosomes and things like that. But uh, So there are very important things happening in the nucleus, but its primary function is to keep your DNA safe as we'll see in a moment with uh, why, we, why we have transcription and translation as separate processes. All right, then we have the rough 
and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or rough ER for short, smooth ER. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the reason it's rough is because it's studded, or I like to say bedazzled, with ribosomes. So remember, ribosomes make proteins. So you know the rough ER plays a role in proteins. So the function of the rough ER is to modify and package proteins. Smooth ER is smooth. There's no ribosome, so forget about proteins. The smooth ER, its job is to inactivate toxins, and it synthesizes some carbohydrates and fats. So it plays a role in creating things, synthesizing things, and inactivating toxins. So if I were to ask you which cells in your body are going to have the most smooth ER, think your liver cells, your hepatocytes, that your liver inactivates toxins, and it's, it's called a manufacturing plant or a lab because it synthesizes things too. So um, this, this could be where like the process of, of tolerance. Let's say you're taking a medication, your body gets used to it. You drink alcohol every day, your body starts to get used to it. You're building up a tolerance. If you looked at the cells in your liver, they would actually have more peroxisome smooth ER. The organelles would change. So one of the coolest things to do is to look at a cell and try to determine what it is based on what organelles it has. What is it designed to do? The anatomy of a cell can tell you about its physiology. Its structure determines its function, just like at the organismal level. Okay, so those are the key organelles, not the only ones, but the key, one, key ones. What is the difference between a free and a fixed ribosome? So they both are ribosomes. They both synthesize proteins. Free ribosomes are just floating free in the cytoplasm of the cell. The flat cytoplasm is basically the guts. If, you, if you're just talking about the liquid, it's the cytosol, but the cytoplasm is the guts. So they're, in, they're just free floating. That's why they're called free ribosomes. The big difference is they make proteins that are going to stay in that cell. Fixed ribosomes are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So they're going to make proteins that are modified and packaged and secreted out of the cell. So that's the big difference. Free ribosomes make proteins for this cell. Fixed ribosomes make proteins for other locations. So imagine I'm like, I'm an islet of Langerhans, which is a cell in your pancreas that makes insulin. So I'm going to make proteins that keep my cell happy and alive, and I'm going to make the protein insulin, which will be secreted out into the bloodstream and, and function where it's needed. Okay, big one, define a gene, transcription and translation. So a gene is a sequence of DNA. So you're made of 3 billion base pairs of DNA, but only 2%, give or take of that DNA, is actually genes. Most of our DNA is non-coding. Excuse me. So a gene is a segment or sequence of DNA that codes for a functional product. That functional product, product is usually proteins. So that's what a gene is. Transcription versus translation. So um, I, I like to use the terms to describe what they do. So just real quickly, I'll define them. Transcription is the conversion of DNA into RNA. Translation is the conversion of RNA into protein. So let's think about those terms. When I think of transcription, I think of a medical transcriptionist. So when I was... Uh, when I was still practicing, I would use little audio tapes. Now everything's digital, but these little teeny audio cassette tapes, and I would transcribe my chart notes, or I would just record them. I would give a bag of these little cassettes to someone on Friday, and on Monday there would be a pile of reports for me to look at and sign. So what's a transcriptionist do? They change the form of the message. If I said the wrong word, it would be typed wrong. So they don't change the message. They change the form of the message but they don't change the language either. That's what a translator does. So transcription, I'm changing the form of the message, but not the message. So transcription, DNA is becoming RNA, just like an audio becomes written, DNA, double-stranded A, C, G, and T, becomes RNA, single-stranded A, C, G, and U. But they're still the same language. They're still both speaking the nucleic acid language. Translation, a translator changes the language. I used to be a designated civil surgeon. I did immigration status exams for people trying to come into the, the country and become citizens. Um, I, I, I knew some Spanish, but I, I always use a translator. So if I said something in English, they would translate it in Spanish. Um, the message shouldn't have changed, but the language did. So translation, you're taking RNA, which speaks the nucleic acid language, and you're converting it into proteins, which speak the amino acid language. So let the terms transcription and translation help you. But the process, uh, again, this is a longer one, but the process, here, here's how I think of it. Um, your genes, the 23,500 genes that make you you, that you got, you know, from a combination from your mom and your dad, um, they're basically, think of them as like a family heirloom cookbook. All these genes get put together. So the nucleus is your house. So transcription is needed because if somebody wants your grandma, your great grandma's uh, chocolate chip cookie recipe, you're not going to give them your DNA. You're not going to give them this cookbook. It's too valuable. So your DNA stays in the nucleus where it's safe and protected. If somebody wants that recipe, they can make a copy of it. 
they can make a photocopy of it, they can scan it, they can take a picture of it with their phone, or they can use a recipe card, right? That's what transcription is. I'm not giving you my DNA. I'm keeping it safe, locked up here in this vault. But you can make a copy of that gene. And that's what transcription does, takes a, a, an RNA copy of DNA. Then you can take that home and you can make these cookies. That's what translation is. RNA is the recipe, the blueprint for um, how to make that cookie. Here's the ingredients, here's the steps. And then translation is actually making the cookies. So that's kind of one of my favorite analogies is um, the reason we have transcription is so we can use our DNA out in the cell without having to have our DNA go out in the cell where it's, where it's not protected. So transcription makes a copy that then snakes out of the nucleus, goes and finds ribosomes, and that's where it's translated. So transcription, converting DNA into RNA, translation, RNA into proteins. Okay, what four nucleotides make up DNA and how do they pair up? So DNA is A, C, G, and T adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And how they pair up is A always pairs with T, C pairs with G. Those are called your complementary base pairs. So if I give you a strand of DNA and say, what's the complementary strand? Just remember, if there's an A, put a T. If there's a T, put an A. If there's a C, put a G. If there's a G, put a C. Now, if I were to take that same sequence of DNA and say, what would the RNA strand of it look like? It will look the same, except RNA does not have T, it has U. So it'd be, if I give you an A, you'd put a U. If I give you a T, you'd put an A, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the four nucleotides that make up DNA and how they pair up. Define, so diffusion versus osmo osmosis. Actually, let's do all three. I like to compare all three at once, then we'll get into some details. Diffusion versus osmosis versus active transport. So diffusion is the movement of solute. So we covered earlier that in a solution, solvent is what's there in the, in the highest abundance and solutes are going to be dissolved in it. Diffusion is the movement of solute from an area of high to low concentration. We'll come back. Osmosis, the movement of water, the solvent from high to low concentration. So whereas diffusion is solutes spreading out, osmosis is the diffusion of water. It's water spreading out. So they're both going from areas of high to low concentration. Active transport is the movement of solutes from low to high concentration. So active transport is the opposite of diffusion. So just remember, so we'll go through all these, but there's diffusion. Osmosis, think of it as the diffusion of water. Active transport, think of it as the opposite of diffusion. So I try to connect all three there. Okay, so diffusion, the movement of solute from high to low concentration. Here's the analogy I like to use. Got 20 students in this room, give them all a jump rope, put them in the corner. They're whipping the bejesus out of each other because as they're all trying to jump rope. So what are they going to do? They're going to spread out. So just like in gym class or football practice, you're going to get your own personal space and everyone's going to spread out. That's how diffusion works. Things, because there's a bunch of them, they're colliding with each other when they're too close together. They're going to spread out to minimize those collisions. Now you can make it more complicated than that if you want, but you don't need to. So if I, um, if I take Kool-Aid, take my Kool-Aid powder, take my sugar and put it in water, it will diffuse and become Kool-Aid on its own. Now we speed it up because we're in a hurry. You don't want Kool-Aid later, you want it now. So you stir it, right? That's going to increase the molecular motion and speed this process up. But that's what diffusion is. So think about those, those students whipping each other with, um, with um, jump ropes. So diffusion, solutes moving out. Osmosis is, so if diffusion can work, if there's not a membrane stopping those students from moving, they'll move. But osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high to low concentration. So uh, the movement, of, the technical definition would be the movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. What that's saying is those whipping jump ropers can't move, so water will come in and fill in the cracks between them. So it's, it is the diffusion of water. So water's moving from where there's a lot of it to where there's not. So here's the simplest way to understand osmosis though. It is water follows solutes. So if I show you a cell and say the cell has more solutes in it than the fluid that it's in, water is going to follow those, sol those solutes in. If I show you a cell that has less solutes than the fluid around it, water is going to follow those solutes out. So don't overthink this. Just remember, water follows solutes. So that's osmosis. Active transport, you're going to go the opposite direction. Sometimes we have to do that. Uh, but the problem is you're, uh, the diffusion and osmosis are both passive processes, meaning they don't require energy in the form of ATP. Active transport, you're trying to cram more things where there's already a lot of things. So that requires energy. You're trying to imagine trying to like squeeze that suitcase full or clothes that's too full. 
So active transport, you're moving things from where there's not a lot of it to where there's already a lot of it. So let me give you some examples because uh, it doesn't make as much sense. Why would you want to do that? Well, the best example is the next one on the list here, the sodium-potassium exchange pump, which is your, in order for your nerves to function, you have to pump sodium out of the cell where there's already a lot of sodium and pump potassium into the cell where there's already a lot of potassium. So that requires a ton of energy. So um, just so you know, your brain, your brain is like a couple percent of your body weight and it uses 20 to 25% of your energy. 40% of the energy your brain's going to use today powers this one pump. That's how important it is. Um, if it weren't for active transport, we couldn't store things, right? If we had extra nutrients stored in a cell, it would leak out, these kind of things. Another good example would be the, the proton pumps in your stomach. If you're going to pump hydrogen ions into your stomach to lower the pH of the stomach juices, there's already a lot of hydrogen ions there. So you got, it takes energy to pump those into the cell or into the stomach. That's what, you know, proton pump inhibitors are going to be the drugs that people are, get, get when they have heartburn. Well, I won't get into the significance of that and, or if it's a good idea. But they're, um, um, they're, they're, they're these proton pumps that require energy are what they're actually stopping. So, all right, so that's the, the difference between active and passive. So the next point there, what's the difference? Active transport mechanisms require energy. Passive mechanisms do not. All right, so I think I covered active transport pretty good there. Here's the most important example, though. For every ATP molecule used by the sodium-potassium exchange pump, two sodium ions are going to be ejected out, and three potassium ions are going to be reclaimed. So that's, so, that, that's how the sodium-potassium exchange pump works. All right, sorry, I had to pause there for a second. Uh, somebody was coming in. So let me just review that. So sodium-potassium exchange pump, you're pumping three sodiums out of these cells and pumping two in. So you'll see why that's significant when we learn about uh, nerve transmission. So that's what generates the, the voltage differences that allow our nerves to send and receive electrical impulses. So three sodiums out, two potassiums in. Sodium is Na+, plus, potassium is K+. Plus. They're both positive ions or cations. Okay, review the ways that fluid and solute move across cell membranes. So we talked about the big ones. You've got diffusion and osmosis, with it, which are the two key passive processes. Now we have, there's channel-mediated diffusion, there's facilitated diffusion. We'll, we'll, you don't have to get into that right now. Um, then we have the active processes. The most important one to me is active transport, but you do also have what are, what's called vesicular transport or using little transport vesicles called, uh, well, they're vesicles. Um, there, there's exocytosis. That's how things that are made and packaged in cells are going to be secreted out um, through, through the rough ER, you know, uh, ribosomes making them, rough ER modifying, packaging them, the Golgi apparatus, putting them in these vesicles, and then putting little shipping tags on them, and then shooting them out of the cells. That's called exocytosis. Then you have endocytosis, how we bring things into the cell. Um, the two key examples there would be phagocytosis. You've probably heard of an, you know, an amoeba using phagocytosis. Phago means to eat. So cell eating would be phagocytosis. Then there's pinocytosis, pino meaning to drink. So you're drinking in things. So that's how your cells eat and drink, if you want to look at it that way. All right. So those are the key ways that fluids and solutes move across your cell membranes. Last one, it's a big one though. Know the key steps in the cell life cycle and what occurs during these steps. So uh, the ones, I, I break them down this way. Interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. So you might see slightly different variations here. Interphase. This is the, you know, for most cells, 90% of their time is in interface. Interface is when the cell is not dividing. It's doing its job, right? Like, so you're, you're not always making children. You're, you know, that's a, that's a small percentage of your overall life here. And of course we're caring for them, but, um, uh, but you're doing your job. You're doing what you're supposed to do. So interface is when the cell is not dividing, but it's doing its job, but it's also preparing to divide. So during interphase, it's not, it's not doing anything. It's, you know, or nothing. It's DNA is being doubled. It's organelles are starting to replicate and make copies. So interphase think not dividing, but preparing to divide. And for most cells, it's 90% of the life cycle now. Um, some cells that, cells that don't divide would never leave interphase. Stem cells are cells that constantly are churning out new cells. They'd barely be in interphase. But for the average cell, I put it about 90%. Then we have PMAT, P-M-A-T, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. That's mitosis. When if I ask you what's mitosis, most people say the division of cells. It's not true. Mito we use the term that way, but uh, division of body cells would be the term mitosis. Meiosis would be the division of sex cells. But um, mitosis is, what it technically means is the division of the nucleus. That's why, like, for example, bacteria, when they divide, they do a process called binary fission. Almost identical, but we can't call it mitosis because bacteria don't have 
have a nucleus. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, in the middle of the cell life cycle, that's the division of the nucleus. So during prophase, the one nucleus we do have disappears for unknown reasons. During metaphase, all your DNA lines up at the equator or the center of the cell. During anaphase, the, the DNA is being pulled in two piles. So now we have two piles of DNA instead of one. During telophase, some say telophase, two new nuclei form around those two clusters of DNA, and then you're done. Now, you're, now your nucleus has divided. So that's mitosis. The last step, cytokinesis, the cell actually will split in two. So interphase, you're preparing for division. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, the nucleus is dividing. Cytokinesis is actual cell division, where the cell now divides. One cell becomes two. And then, of course, they're doing their job. They're going to grow a little bit. They're going to prepare to divide if they do. And there they go. So, all right, that is the review of cell structure and function, or cytology. So get your learn on, guys.